Good morning, community. How are you feeling this morning? I don't know about you, that was, that was really powerful. Would you just uh, give it up for Bobby and Jordan and Sabrina and the whole Stuco team again? I'm so grateful for them and all they do. Uh, okay, so a quick quiz. How many of you know what this is right here? It's not, it's not a trick question. Yeah, George Washington, but what is the item itself? It is, it's right, a dollar. I would have accepted greenback or moolah or presidential flashcards, yeah. So this is pretty recognizable, right? We, we know what it is, um, we can call what it is. Um, what you may not know about this though, this paper dollar is actually not made of paper at all. Did you know that? It's actually 75% cotton, 24% linen, and just 1% rainbows, little known fact. Um, <laughs> Or how about this? How many of you know what this is right here? Anyone know what this is? Say it if you know it. That's right, it's a penny. What you might not know about this penny though is it actually costs more than a penny to make this penny. Did you know that? According to the US Mint, each penny costs 1.7 cents to make, which there's a sermon illustration in there somewhere, I'm sure. But you accumulate enough of these things though and you'll have what some people call Wealth, And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about this topic of wealth. The, the Bible speaks over 800 times about this idea of wealth and resources. In fact, Jesus spends almost a quarter of his earthly ministry talking about what we do with the stuff God has entrusted to us. Now, I just found this out recently, but did you know that the 42 wealthiest people on the planet have as much as the poorest half of the planet? Just, just so that's crystal clear, 42 people have as much as 3.7 billion people. So when we talk about this topic of wealth, this is a topic that I think is really important for all of us to unpack. As Sherry mentioned, we're in week five of our series, Oh Brother, and we're calling it Oh Brother because James is the half-brother of Jesus. No pressure there, right? And we've called it this series because uh, we think that there's a lot of wisdom to learn from the guy who grew up with Jesus. And I think it's no accident that the letter that he writes is incredibly direct and remarkably practical. And right at the very beginning of his letter, he makes it really clear why he's writing. He's writing to this scattered church that was under a lot of persecution, filled with probably a lot of fear. And he writes this letter so that they may become mature and complete mature and complete. But he also knows that on the road to maturity, there are a lot of pitfalls. And so for this series, we've been unpacking what are some of those pitfalls that can trip us up from becoming mature and complete in Christ. And so today, we wanna to talk about wealth. Now we've also been sharing some details about James himself because maybe you didn't know much about this writer, this half-brother of Jesus. And uh, we've learned different stats and stories about his life and ministry. And today, what, what I found really fascinating is that one of his nicknames was James the Just. James the Just, which I think is so fitting for today. Because when you read his letter, when you really, really dive into what he values, he's someone who lives an incredibly disciplined, incredibly just life. And so in chapter 5, it begins this way. It says, now listen, you rich people. Okay, so how many people just took a, like a big sigh of relief? You're like, phew, this one doesn't apply to me. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> I want to make the assertion that James actually is, in fact, speaking to each of us. Did, did you know that um, if you made $40,000 last year, $40,000, do you want to guess what percentage of wage earners you are on the planet? 4%. If you made $40,000, you're in the top 4% of wage earners on the planet. If you made $48,000, do you want to know what percentage you're in? Any guesses? You're in the top 1% of wage earners on the planet. In fact, I thought maybe we, let's get really specific to Chicagoland, right? The median annual in income in Chicagoland is roughly $66,000. If you made $66,000 last year, do you want to guess what percentage you're in? Point one five percent of wage earners on the planet in the entire globe so let's be really clear that james when he says listen you rich people he's speaking 
to us. Now, Money Magazine a few years ago did a survey of their readers and uh, the question that was asked was, how much money would you need in liquid assets to consider yourself rich, to feel rich? Do you wanna know what their answer was? When asked how much money in liquid assets would you need to feel rich, the answer was $5 million. $5 million. That means that if that person had $2 million, they'd be like, nah, I'm destitute. I'm <laughs> barely making ends meet, right? Three million, ah, middle, middle of the road, right? In order to feel rich, the answer was $5 million, which I think is really interesting because the problem when we don't know that we're rich, we don't act like we're rich, right? Nobody's rich, but everyone knows someone who is. Are we tracking? I'm not rich, but I certainly could, I could send you the address of someone I know is rich. Nobody's rich, but everyone knows someone who is rich. And I think James would say to all of us in this room today, no, no, that's us. We, we are each rich. In fact, why don't, you, why don't you just turn to a neighbor right now and say, I think he's talking to you. Just look him right in the eye. Yeah, I think he's, <laughs> I think he's talking to you. Excellent. So in chapter five, uh, James jumps right in. I wanna read the whole verse here. James chapter five, verse one. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Now, I, I, don't, I don't write the mail, I just deliver it, right? But James comes at us pretty direct, pretty intensely, and in this next section, he's gonna lay out four really intense warnings that I think each of us should heed. Really, really intense warnings that I, I hope will challenge and encourage us this morning. The, the first warning is this, don't hoard. James says, don't hoard. In uh, verses two and three, he says this, your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. So again, J James is kind of going right at it, right to the heart. Did, did you know that Americans now have 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage? 2.3 Billion with a B. That comes out to about seven square feet for every human in the country. And the vast majority of these people have either a garage, an attic, or a basement, which means we're storing all the extra stuff that we can't fit in our homes. Now, I, notice what James says here just in verse two, right? He says, your, your wealth has rotted and your moths have eaten your clothes. I, I found that verse to be really fascinating because moths don't eat clothes that are being worn, right? Like the food you're eating isn't the food that rots. And I started thinking about, like how many of us have clothes that we haven't worn for like a decade or more? Anyone have like a sweater or a jacket or a shirt? Don't lie, this is church, right? Like 10 years or more, haven't even touched it. I thought about a, a sweater that I bought about 15 years ago that I love, here it is. Um, <laughs> Spontaneous applause, outstanding. Um, and I don't even think this, this picture does it justice. In fact, um, like that kitty's eyes are actual like emeralds. So it's like this, it's got this three dimensional vibe to it. And um, I'd like to tell you that this was for an ugly sweater party, but like no one else in the picture is wearing an ugly sweater. <laughs> so moment of confession, I still have that sweater. In fact, I'm gonna put it on for you right now. Um, I'm just kidding, I don't have it, I don't have it with me. Um, but every single time we like pack or clean or move, when I come to the sweater, I think, yeah, I should hold on to this a bit longer, right? This is gonna come in handy. I don't know when a sweater like that would ever come in handy, but we all have stuff like that though, right? That we just, we keep, and maybe it's for sentimental reasons, maybe it's out of fear that like as soon as we get rid of it, it'll become usable, it'll be something that I need. But I, I gotta ask though, in a, in a world of need, do any of us have a car while other people don't have transportation? Do any of us have an extra bed while those sleep on floors every night? Do, do any of us have extra clothes while others wear the same clothes day in and day out? My, my, my point isn't that we like, shouldn't have things at all. My point is that I think James is asking us to have a broader global perspective of the people 
around us. Look at our things as gifts given to us to steward well. Did you know that a billion people in this world, a billion live on less than $1 a day? One billion people on planet Earth live on less than a dollar a day. Three billion people live on less than $2 a day. We are incredibly rich. Now this idea of like taking and storing and hoarding, right? Like at the surface, it doesn't, it doesn't seem all that bad, but I, I would argue that it's actually the opposite of the gospel message. This idea of like taking, throwing an elbow, getting a pile bigger than your pile. The gospel message is that when we could do nothing to earn or deserve it, Jesus, who was rich, became poor for our sake, emptied himself, became obedient even to death on a cross so that we might live, so that we could have peace with God and peace with others. The very center of the gospel message is that it isn't about grasping for more and more and more, but by God himself modeling what it looks like to to have hands open, that a God so loved the world that he what? He gave, that the very essence of his ontology is a God who is generous and we're made in the image and likeness of that God. God doesn't simply just say, you should just be generous because it's a good idea. He's saying, it's how I'm wired, it's how I wired you, to live generously, to see everything that you have as a gift on loan to you that we are to steward well. So James says, don't, don't hoard, but be wise. Don't hoard, be wise. Now, I don't think James is like against saving. I don't think he's against having a bank account. I think he wants to draw the difference between wise saving and unwise hoarding. Now, his second warning comes in verse four. He says, don't cheat, don't cheat. In verse four, he writes this. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Now there's a lot going on here, um, so I'll unpack it briefly. Part of the way someone would earn wages, particularly in this agrarian society, was to hire day laborers. And so a day laborer was typically paid at the end of every day they worked. And they were often so poor that whatever they were paid that day went toward their next meal. Right? So a lot of these day laborers, they don't, they don't have 401ks, they don't have savings account. Whatever they're paid that day went to buying their next meager meal. And so you have this landowner who's apparently doing well enough that he has land and the money to hire people is holding out on the people that he owes money to. Now in this day, there were no contracts, there were no labor unions, so a landowner could look at the work and just simply go, nah, I'm not gonna pay for that. That's not up to my standards, I don't, I don't want to. Another way that you could cheat the people was that often these day laborers had to keep traveling wherever the work was. So if you held out longer than a day, more likely than not, that laborer had to move on to the next field, right? And it says mowing the fields. This isn't like John Deere, like summer camp. This is not that kind of mowing. This is like, like grueling, painful work. And so the landowner could just simply make up excuses like, I, my guy hasn't gotten out there to see if the work was done yet. I haven't actually had the chance to go see what it looks like. I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you, I'll get back to you. And he's cheating these people. And it's not right. It's not good. Now again, I think it's easy to read verses like this and think, whew, I'm off the hook. I don't employ anybody, right? Now I think this verse actually applies to to a whole lot more than simply people who employ other people. Have any of us ever been guilty of charging too much for something? Any of us been guilty of selling a used car with problems we didn't tell the person about? Any of us wasted time at work, time that we were being paid for. In fact, I, I, think, I think James would even go after those of us who are inclined to be stingy. Now there's a difference, there's a difference between frugality and stinginess. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Frugal is using that two for one coupon at your favorite restaurant. Like good on you, way to go. Good use of that coupon. Stingy is then tipping your server based on that discounted meal. That's Stingy. As Christ followers, we are not called to cheat or to steal or to be stingy. We're called to be a people of radical generosity because God has been radically generous with us. That's the whole point. It might be wise for us to reflect on the golden rule here. Maybe we could ask this question. 
Do I treat others the way I would like to be treated, or do I benefit at the cost of other people? Do I benefit at the cost of other people? James would say to us, don't cheat, but be fair. Don't cheat, be fair. He's warning us, don't value money more than you value people. Don't value your stuff more than you value the community that God has placed you in. Because here's the humbling truth. The humbling truth is this. We'll either love people and use things, or we'll love things and use people. I fully believe, we will either love people deeply and we'll use our resources to love them better, or we'll love our things so much that we'll use people to get more and more of those things. I believe that's what James is telling us today. You'll either love people and use things or love things and use people, which brings us to warning number three. Warning number three is don't waste. Don't waste. James 5.5 5 puts it this way. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of, what's the word? Slaughter. Okay, so that's an intense, that's an aggressive word. And most of us probably didn't grow up on a farm but like, what do you tend to do with a pig when you're preparing it for the slaughter? You just keep feeding it, right? And like, if you're the other piggies, you probably are looking like, you're looking at the one being prepared for the slaughter. You're looking, you know, at Chubby McChub Chubs over there and you're thinking, man, that's the life. He just eats and eats and eats. And maybe he's thinking like, yeah, I'm just, gonna, this, is the, this is the best, I, this is the best way to live. Life could not be better. James is saying this analogy here is that those who continue to engorge themselves to, st- to stack up bigger and bigger piles, they're fattening themselves for destruction. Apparently in James's day, p- people were indulging while others were going hungry. They were fattening themselves up while others couldn't even find a meal. I think the thing that's really uh, humbling for me is that the more money we make, the less we give percentage-wise. The more money we make, the less we will give percentage-wise. It's, it's, it's really easy to buy into this idea, I can't be generous right now, but once I make this amount of money, then I'm gonna be radically generous. Um, the statistics would say Otherwise, here are a few stats. Uh, If you have a median household income of $50,000, on average, you will give 6% away. The next bracket is $200,000. If you have a median family household income of $200,000, on average, you will give 4% away. And the trend continues. In fact, um, in Chicagoland, right, um, in 2011, the, the 20%, 20% of the wealthiest people gave 1.3% of it away to charity. The wealthiest 20% gave away 1.3% away. Th- this is what money does to us. We buy into the myth that like, well, if I was making that, then I'd become radically generous. And James is saying, beware. Watch what's happening there. This is the way that wealth can work. At one point in history, uh, John D. Rockefeller was the wealthiest man on planet Earth. And uh, in a really haunting interview with a reporter, the reporter asked, um, John, how, how much is enough? Right, he's, he's number one, he's king. How, how much is enough? And he gave such a bone chilling response. You know what his response was? Just a little more. Just a little more. Wealthiest man in the world when asked how much is enough, just a little more. And I think it's easy for us to buy into that same type of reasoning. Just a little more will make me happy. Just a little more will make me fulfilled. Just a little more and then I'll become this other person. And James says, watch out. Now interestingly, the opposite is true though as well. There's a a famous psychiatrist named Carl Menninger and, and listen to what he says about generosity. He says, money giving is a very good criterion in a way of a person's mental health. Generous people are rarely mentally ill people. Not always, but generally. Now this guy's not a Christ follower and he he seems to believe that there is actually a physiological correspondence between our ability to let go, to loosen our white knuckled grip on our stuff and our actual physiological health, our neurological health. He says, man, the guy that's always clinging, always hoarding, always stockpiling, that's not a good sign. All of us are hardwired to be a people of generosity, period. We're made in the image and likeness of a God who is generous. 
That's why when we do it, that's why when we read, it's better to give than receive. There's some truth to that, even for those that maybe don't believe in the Bible or Jesus or any of this Christianity stuff at all. When you experience there's some sort of like cosmic sacred, aha, that's right. That's true. James says, don't get fat while others go hungry. He says, don't waste, but be generous. Be a people of generosity. And here's what I find so fascinating about that. That was like the marker of the early church. Think about that. The early church didn't have stages and screens and sound systems and instruments. They didn't have any of that stuff. But what they had was their generosity. And even people who didn't like these Christ followers at all, it's, it's recorded in history, write things like, it's mind-blowing how generous they are, not just with their own people, but with everyone they encounter. Over and over and over again, history records a marker of early Christianity is not stages and platforms and really, really keen theology, but the ability to relinquish the stuff that we have to bless other people, to care for other people, even if they're not a part of your tribe. That's what the church had. That's what the church was known for. That brings me to warning number four. Don't buy into the system. Don't buy into the system. Verse six puts it this way. You've condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. So again, we might be inclined to sort of, whew, I haven't murdered anyone in a while. I'm off the hook, right? Like that's, I'm, I'm good to go. But, but let me push on this a little bit. Because when James wrote this, there certainly were people who were buying off judges and doing things like that. But I, I think more interestingly, he's going after people who perpetuated systems of oppression. When he, when he talks about the rich in this passage, um, a lot of who he's addressing are like the, the religious elite, the Jerusalem elite. And uh, what they were doing was sort of fattening themselves on the sacrifices of faithful Jews, um, all the while perpetuating the system of keeping the poor poor, and their posture toward God was pragmatic at best. The system kept them at the top. And that was not unintentional. That was incredibly deliberate. They worked really hard to keep the status quo as a way of staying in power. And the system was not just. And not surprisingly, James the Just takes issue with that. He's got a problem with that. Now again today, it may not be as obvious, but we're, like, we're all surrounded by systems, aren't we? Like systems that take away our garbage, systems that deliver us food, systems that make our clothes. And most of us don't make the time to really research how those systems work, the integrity of those systems. Were the people making this food or making these clothes, were they paid a fair wage? Were they treated with dignity and honor? Were the business practices full of integrity? Most of us don't have the time to research those things. Well, years ago, I found a website called slaveryfootprint.org, and it's a site devoted to educating people about their consumer power to end slavery across the globe. I took this test, and I'm gonna be really honest, it was incredibly humbling. I took the test and just punched in the information about the stuff that I consume and the stuff that I buy and the stuff that I use, and I found that I employ 64 slaves. There, there are these supply chains that perpetuate systems of oppression. Some companies are aware of it, some companies are not. But more people are enslaved today than at any point in human history. More people are enslaved on planet Earth today than at any point in human history. I cannot encourage you enough, carve out some time, take that test because it will be eye-opening. Now there, there are some easy ways that we can begin to be more just with our consumption. And I don't have a whole lot of time to go into all of it, but one website I would encourage you to check out is fairtradecertified.org. Fairtrade is this, uh, it's like this global movement of companies and shoppers and organizations to put people first, to ask the kinds of questions that I think James would ask us. You can find products and shopping guides and recipes that are all Fairtrade certified. And I'm not talking about just the boring stuff. I'm talking about some of the good stuff like coffee, Chocolate, can I get an amen, right? Like, it may cost a little more, but then we can know that we are not buying into this system that keeps the poorest people poor, that oppresses people, that builds products on the backs of injustice. James is saying, don't, don't buy into the system. Be just. Be just. And it can't be just about 
going on a mission trip once in a while or signing a petition here and there saying, be just in everything that you do and the resources that God has given you. Be a good steward of what he's given you. Now the possibility that that great wealth can accomplish is massive. I don't think James is against people being wealthy or having savings account. The things that can be accomplished with wealth are unbelievable. And the generosity of this community has blown me away the two years that I've been here. It's been unreal just to see the ways that God has used your generosity. It's unbelievable. But I believe that James would still issue us these cautions like we just talked about. Don't hoard, be wise. Don't cheat, be fair. Don't waste, be generous, and don't buy into the system, be just. I think it's conceivable that when James wrote this particular section of scripture, that he was remembering some words that his older brother had said, words about how to treat people, how to care for people, how to put people first. Jesus, when he says this, he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But he gives us an alternative. He says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Malls of vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus, James, they're always doing this. It's not even ultimately about dollars and pennies. It's about the heart. He's saying, do you want to know what's actually going on at the heart level? Look at your bank account. Our money, our resources, how we spend what's been given to us will say more about what's happening in our heart than anything else. Jesus says, do you wanna know what's going on at the heart? Look at your resources. Look, look at your money. It's an indication of what's going on beneath the surface. So I wanna close with this passage written by the Apostle Paul, and he wrote it to a young apprentice named Timothy. And he's instructing Timothy about how to lead, how to serve, how how do we call people to this different way of living? And here's what he says. He says, suggest those, no, 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 what's that word say? Command them. Put some energy behind it. Put some gravity behind it. Command those who are, what's the word? Rich, and who, who are the rich? Us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, in order to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in who? In God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them again to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be, what's the word? To be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasures not here on earth. They'll lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I believe that with all my being. Generosity isn't something that someone on a stage guilts you to do, that we do out of obligation or reluctance. Paul, James, Jesus, they're saying, do you want to really live? Do you want to take hold of the life that is really life? Loosen your grip on the stuff that God has entrusted to you. See all of life, regardless of what you have or don't have, as a gift from God to love people well. Because at the end of the day, you, you can't satisfy the eternal with the temporal. We were created for eternity, which means we can't satisfy it with the temporal. Maybe as we wrap up today, we we could all say this together. I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides. Would Would you say that with me? I will not place my hope in riches, but in him who richly provides. That that's what it's about. Is because when we put our hope in our wealth, right? Our hope migrates. It migrates away from the one who built us, who loves us, who's pursuing us and seeks us. That's the danger. That's the caution that when we hoard, when we stockpile, when we cheat, when we're stingy, man, our hope begins to migrate towards those things. And I'm telling you, friends, it does not deliver. It doesn't. Imagine if we became a people who understood this call to be generous. 
I think that if we became a people of radical generosity, there would be a line outside this door. People who say, I wanna be a part of that. They love everyone. They give so generously. It doesn't even make sense half the time. I wanna be a part of that movement that's making a difference in the world. Maybe we should all ask this morning, what am I doing with what God has entrusted me with? And I would love for us to be a people of wild generosity not for our own glory, but so that the world would see that and glorify God, the God who is generous with and to each and every one of us, that we then in turn live generously to a world so in need of it. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for loving us way beyond what we could ever dream of or deserve or earn. And I think that's the point. At the very center of the story, It isn't about us cleaning up our act, impressing you with our things. It's not about coming with arms full of all we can do for you, but arms empty saying, God, would you use me? So God, whatever those warnings resonates with us, whatever thing kind of illuminated something for us this morning, would you give us the courage and the strength to walk that truth out, to live as generous people because of your generosity to us? God, we thank you and we love you. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said.